Hi guys, welcome to the video. I hope you're doing fine. And uh, I, I just want to first introduce myself. So who am I? I'm Manik Madan. I'm, I'm an intern that's fifth year, medical, fifth year of medical school. And I'm from Kim's Medical College, Bangalore, India. And I'm currently a non-US IMG. So guys, this is my step one score. I gave my step one on March 12, 2020. And I got a score of 260 on the step one. And guys, when you when you get a score like this and you've worked so hard for it, like it brings like I, I was just crying and I was, you know, in, in laughter and I was so happy. And come to think of it, I might even frame this guys. I, I literally might might even frame this. So guys, before we get into the main part of the video, I just want to say this, okay? If you don't believe it, you won't ever achieve it. This is my philosophy for life. This is my philosophy for step one. This is, this is going to be my philosophy for step two. This is going to be my philosophy for everything in life. Okay. So what you want to know is you need to first believe in something to first achieve it. Right. Just the first part to anything is to first believe it and then put in all the hard work you can and then achieve that thing. Right. So, so what I want you to tell yourself every single day is believe you can do anything. Tell yourself every single day you can do anything. And tell yourself scoring a 260 plus or, or 270 is no big deal. It's easy, it's gonna be easy, easy and super awesome. It's gonna be chill, okay? And you guys only it's going to be super, super fun and we're gonna enjoy it. We're gonna enjoy the whole process and not worry about the outcome. And we're gonna make it, guys. So I, I just want to jump into uh, fast, jump fast into the contents of the video. First, we'll run through the USMLE question pattern on how USMLE questions are. Then we'll go through uh, towards the best overall resources for step one. And then we'll discuss my study schedule, my timeline. And uh, uh, I want to talk about question banks. Question banks is why question banks are super important. And so many people do not realize this and we'll talk about these guys. Then I want to talk about subject wise resources and resources used in my medical school. And then we will talk about tracking progress and the regrets I had during my like regrets I had during my journey. So first let's talk about the US only step one pattern. And this is what I mean by this is basically how are the quotients on step one, right? So the quotients on step one. They require multi-level thinking and reasoning and most of the questions are not straightforward. They are not straightforward at all. They're, they require lots of thinking and so a, a typical question on step one isn't like, okay, a patient uh, isn't like, okay, so you have MI, what is the pathophysiology of MI? That is not how step one works. Step one will give you something called a clinical vignette of a patient presenting with the symptoms of MI and they would not tell you that it's MI they will just give the presentation of MI like chest pain, diaphoresis, nausea, and you have to figure out what's MI and then they'll ask you the path of MI. What hap What is the pathophysiology of MI? And it'll be in the question and you need to pick up the answer. So it's like, it'll, it's a lot more complex than just, you know, simple tests. And so there's, there's mostly no first order questions. And you need deep and strong concepts to solve most of the questions. And so the two main abilities, I think you need to score a 260 plus or a 270 plus score is basically ability to do a differential diagnosis. So what a differential diagnosis is basically, you know, a patient presents with symptoms like jaundice, uh, hepatomegaly and fever. fever what can this patient really have now out of the, this is basically it can be hepatitis hep a hep b that is acute one or acute hep c it can be malaria it can be babesia and so many so you so what a differential diagnosis is you look at the symptoms and what could the causes be it could be hepatitis a it could be acute hepatitis b it could be acute hepatitis c it could be malaria babesia and then you use something called the elimination principle to you know so suppose you get a question and all of these would be the answer choices and they'll ask you what what does this patient have they'll give you the symptoms of the patient and they'll ask you what the patient has and you need to use an elimination principle to you know 
eliminate certain choices and come to the answer it could the answer could be acute hepatitis c and how you do this is by basically using like we will come to this later and uh, i'll explain this later first go through examples so the fir first thing i wanted to take on is the 260 plus question solving mindset so you need to have a proper strategy to solve questions and this is all about that so what do you want to you know you what you want to keep in mind is you want to think like the question writer how is the question writer thinking this is what i call tactical em empathy tactical empathy is having empathy with the question writer and what and there are certain questions you need to ask yourself to be in empathy with the question writer so you want to ask to your like to yourself what's the point of this question what is the question writer trying to ask me what what does he want me to like you want to ask this question like what do they want me to do what is the question writer want me to do and what concept do they want me to elicit that is super important guys that is super huge and i'll show you how this comes in handy so first we'll take a tactical approach we won't start like from the first line how you how i want you to solve questions is basically like this okay first you want to identify something called a key this is the key of the question then like just read to the key and like what it says what does she have okay what does she have there and like you know they're asking me some kind of diagnosis second go to the answers third go through the stem of the question so this is the stem of the question guys this is called the question stem right so first this is a first order question and i'll show you how it's a first order question and you know first let's go through the stem okay a 14 year old so what like go and underline the 14 year old like let's circle that a 14 year old what's her age so she's a very young person a 14 year old is brought to the physician because she it's a she she has not yet her had her first menstrual period so this might be something like primary amenorrhea she feels pain in her legs during sports in her school this might be cramping claudication she is at the 25 percentile for height so she, her height is less and 60 percentile for weight her temperature is normal pulse is 70 per minute bp is high examination shows a high arch palate a low posterior hairline the patient has a broad chest with widely spaced nipples pelvic examination shows normal external genital area there is scant pubic hair important guys so this patient has some kind of primary amenorrhea and and if you can look through it her height is less and she has some kind of cramping claudication and her bp is high and she has all these abnormalities plus she has scant pubic hair the most probable diagnosis here is turner syndrome guys this is something called a first order question so they give you a clinical vignette right they give you a clinical vignette and you just figure out the answer that's turner syndrome this is something called first order because you did not have to think much through it now i'll show you and like you know what is the second order question so guys uh, this again is the key read the key part of one of the process and go through the answers note the question stem is the same as the previous question the first order question and i won't read through it again so this patient like has a diagnosis of turner syndrome you have to make the diagnosis now however i do not see turner syndrome in the answer choices so this is not for shorter question uh, first order question guys this is a second order question and what they are asking me is what happens in turner syndrome right and from most of you who know the uh, answer the answer is i think increased fsh this is the answer why this is the answer is basically because in turner syndrome you have something called ovarian dysgenesis and once you have ovarian dysgenesis what happens is basically you have decreased estrogen and what happens because of decreased estrogen the negative feedback loop breaks and you have increased gnrh and because of that you have increased fsh and lh and that's why that's the answer some of you might be thinking why isn't decreased estrogen estrogen an answer the reason for that is because estrogen is a pregnancy estrogen and that's not really handy here because it's not relevant here right so this is a second order question first you have to make the diagnosis of turner syndrome then you have to figure out okay what does she have and so she had increased fsh so that's a second order question so now let's look at third order question right so we're increasing the difficulty of it first look at the key she is at risk of 
this is the key so they are asking me some kind of adverse effect then they're asked uh, then go through the answer choices look at it and then read the stem of the question guys the stem again is the same as the first and second order questions however i've changed the key so this again is turner syndrome the answer here is urinary tract infection you would be like manik how do i figure out this urinary tract infection well here's how you do it first you made a diagnosis of turner syndrome then you have to think about what complications are there and one complication is horseshoe kidney horseshoe kidney and because of horseshoe kidney you get increased chances of urinary tract infections and so this was the third question first you had to know what the diagnosis was second you had to know what the complication was and then you had to know what, what the complication of the complication was so the most common things you get on usmle are second and third orders guys you would not get that many first order questions keep that in mind and because of that you need to have very deep concepts as you saw through that you have to know even the complication of complication and that's that's like that makes for a tough exam and because of that you need very very strong concepts so i i want to bring home one point and i think this is so important guys you won't know everything on the test ever sorry for the mistake yeah you won't know everything on the test ever and even if you have done all the resources for step one this will be true no matter what this will be true no matter what guys so manik if i don't know everything on the test right how do i figure out answers to questions i don't know the answer to well there are ways to come to the answer without knowing the answer and that's something called elimination guys and I can't discuss all about it just in this video because it's a very big topic and I will make a video about it later however I just want to like go into you know basics of you know how elimination works so elimination is based on you could be eliminate stuff on history you're going to eliminate stuff on age you're going to eliminate stuff on sex and you can eliminate stuff on ethnicity then you can eliminate stuff on physical examination findings and then you can eliminate stuff on laboratory findings let me show you how this works so let's start with elimination guys so this is a completely new question and let's go through how like you know how we should progress first look at the key further evaluation on this patient will show okay uh, so they're asking me some kind of finding or some kind of i think sign and then go through the answer guys answers increase troponin okay let's look at everything okay cool and then we'll go through the question stem so a 75 year old woman so she's 75 year old and she's a woman is brought to the emergency department after losing her consciousness at home at her home she has a history of getting up from the bed and falling and losing consciousness for several seconds so this was temporary probably because it's just for several seconds plus i think she has had a syncope she has a history of atrial fibrillation important guys hypertension angina pectoris she is currently taking aspirin fluorothalidone warfarin nitroglycerin as needed she is afebrile pulse is 110 this is important guys and regular blood pressure is less her pulse is increased she has a dry tongue on physical exam findings her capillary filling time is four seconds that's increased guys however the cardiopulmonary examination is normal further evaluation on this patient will show so so suppose i do not know the answer to this question right how do i come to the answer right so let's start eliminating right so increased troponin is seen in mi and does this patient have an i mi she does have a history of angina pectoris however she, there is no report of no history of chest pain diaphoresis and a nausea plus there there's no the cardiopulmonary examination looks normal so the cardiopulmonary examination is normal so i think she does not have an mi absent pvfs on ecg guys she does have atrial fibrillation so this might be it however please look that her pulse is regular so this means her atrial fibrillation is basically intermittent it's not always on and this might not be the answer because her pulse is regular right now 
elevated BUN. So guys, BUN is basically urea and urea is increased in times of, you know, when the water is less and she does have symptoms of syncope plus she has a dry tongue and her capillary filling time is increased. She has hypotension and her pulse is increased. So this might be it guys. I'll take it into consideration. Let's look into the other choices. Left ventricle hypertrophy guys. So she does have hypertension. So this might be the answer, but she does have hypertension. However, the cardiopulmonary examination is again normal. For hypertension and LVH, you should hear an S4 or the cardiopulmonary examination should so show something. So I don't think this might be the answer. A clot, in a, uh, a clot in her popliteal vein on compression ultrasonography, that's DVT guys. She, I don't think that's the answer guys because she does not have anything in virtuous triad. She does not have a history of leg swelling. She does not have home and sign. So I don't think this is a DVT case guys. So that's out a yeah, friction rubber auscultation that's there in pericarditis. She does not have any symptoms or history that matches pericarditis plus her cardiopulmonary examination is normal and you should get a pericardial rub in pericarditis. So this is not the answer. So we can't, we came to the answer this elevated BUN and it looks like that's the right answer. And she, I think had an orthostatic syncope that's orthostatic hypotension because maybe she was on chlorothalidone that's a thiazide diuretic so this is how you come to the answer without knowing it and i hope you got it i'll make a video about it guys because this is a very big topic to explore and i hope you learned something from this so let's talk let's start talking about the best resources guys i want to divide the best resources into two parts the first is the overall strategy, the overall best resources, and then the subject wise strategy. First, let's discuss the overall strategy. I think this, this is the main strategy you should use. Anybody should use this strategy. And this is the most important one because this strategy is basically based on integration. So what I mean by integration is basically you have all these subjects, right? You have physiology, you have anatomy, you have pathology, you have pharmacology. Step one is basically best done upon is when you connect everything, you connect physio to anat to path to pharmacology. You should like, because it would not give you just a pathology question and ask you, okay, here's a pathology question. Tell me the pathology because it might give you a question. That's basically because the questions will be basically, I'll give you an example. So let's take MI. There's a patient who presents with symptoms of MI. They would not tell you that. And you have a clinical variant of MI. So what you need to know about MI is basically the physiology of MI, the physiology meaning ECG changes and a lot more anatomy where the pain is, substernal pain that may radiate to the jaw or arms, that is left arm. And the pathology is atherosclerotic plaque rupture, atherosclerotic plaque rupture and the pharmacology how you treat it is either you can give a beta blocker or nitrates nitrates is like one of the main ones nitrates is one of the main ones and beta blockers are secondary so this is how you should go about it you should integrate physiology with anatomy with pathology and pharmacology how you do this is basically going system wise and that's the good thing about first aid again is first aid is system wise and you can do like a topic like cardiology. So system wise is like cardiology and first aid gives the physiology, the anatomy, pathology, pharmacology, biochemistry, and everything according to that system like cardiology. So for MI, you will get everything in it. And that's so, so helpful for step one. That is an exam that is very much based on integration. The second thing is about question, uh, question banks, guys. Question banks integrate so much, right? They integrate all the subjects into one question. And that's so, so damn helpful for step one. And we'll come to this later again. I'll explain to you why question banks are very important for step one. And I think they're, they are the most underutilized, but the most important resources. And then we come to this approach called the subject wise approach. Guys, this approach is totally optional. It's upon you if you want to do this. And the thing, the, the thing why I think this is optional is because there's no integration, right? If you do a subject, right? You just do something like Pharmac, you learn just the Pharmac of the stuff, like, but your exam would not present 
to you a question that's just pharmacology it will present to your clinical vignette and you need to know the integration of different subjects to solve that question so i don't think that helps however there's just one thing i like i want to tell you if you have a really weak subjects like you you think you have zero basics and you and you know you're doing a question bank and you think you're not improving on it then you might consider the subject wise approach and we'll discuss the resources later i want to first go into the overall resource uh, list because that's the most important guys and i would not recommend subject wise resource for your main preparation i'll recommend overall resources any day guys for everyone so let's look at, into the best overall resources what i mean by the best overall resources are i think are the most high yield resources so you uh, for guys who know what ufap means so ufap right ufap is basically u world plus first aid plus pathoma right u world plus first aid plus pathoma guys just learn this this is these are going to be the most important resources that you use and anybody who's giving step one should use these resources because i think they are the most high yield resources for step one and i want to come to this so i think first aid is such a high yield book guys and people really underestimate first aid because but i really really want to emphasize this and i can't you know emphasize this again like more and more is first aid is so important guys and you want to make sure you want to make your first aid so strong and how you can do that is by first you know you could you could like use bnb it's a really good resource it's bnb has videos that go according to the first aid pattern and they explain everything system wise and you can make annotations of bnb or for, on first aid and you can complement your first aid with bnb the other thing you want to do is you can use sketchy micro plus farm so sketchy micro and farm are actually based on first aid and they just make make learning first aid very easy because they are just visual mnemonics of first aid guys for micro and farm visual mnemonics for first aid for first aid and that's and they're awesome guys like i love them i use them in my preparation and they're awesome the other thing you want to do is you want to use a question bank like usmle rx usmle rx is based on first aid and you can like i'll, I'll come to this on later but, you, but usmle rx was one of the best resources i found for my own preparation so first i want to go into my study schedule so guys i studied for seven months six months was with my internship and one month was dedicated here i studied about i think i studied about 8 to 11 hours guys that's what i think for my dedicated i studied about 12 to 14 hours my average study time i think for the whole process was about 10 hours a day throughout like both the periods so just oscillate between 8 to 12 hours it oscillated between 8 to 12 hours and sunday like the first half of my preparation my sunday used to be a holiday but towards the second half of the preparation i did not have much time guys so i had to use my sundays for practice tests plus it used to be a holiday sometimes so let's first jump into my timeline guys i would not explain everything if you wanna look at my timeline just pause your video and go through it i have explained everything in great detail and like i just want to explain one thing guys i did use kaplan videos but i used them in my medical school i did not use them for my main preparation however i did use their lecture notes that i made from the videos for reference throughout the process this is super important guys Kaplan was one of the best resources I used. However, I did not have enough time to go through it again in like during my main preparation. So, so now first, let's go into the first one and a half month of my preparation. That was with BNB and FA. So what I did was this was my first pass of FA, first trade, first pass. And how I read first trade was through BNB. So BNB is really great if you want to go through the like if you want to go through first aid for the first time because it's really based on first aid and it has a few concepts that are not mentioned on first aid. However, it 
since it follows the pattern of first aid, you can annotate with it and you can make your own, you know, annotations on first aid of what you, what, what isn't mentioned on first aid and like what concepts you thought you didn't have. You can annotate them on first aid and it's very helpful. Guys, with BNB and FA, I started Sketchy Micro and I completed this within the first one and a half months. Then I switched to Pathoma plus Physio. Why I underline, like why I highlight this is because Pathoma is such a great book for pathology. Like my own pathology was weak guys. And after doing Pathoma, I improved so much and I loved it so much because it's so conceptual and so deep. And you know, he doesn't try to make you memorize everything. He just tries to give you an explanation for everything and concepts. And that is so important for, for step one guys. And he makes such good integrations with you know a few subjects and i mean it's such a lovely source for pathology i wished i would have done this earlier in my second year and i think it's a lovely resource i took about one week to complete this pathoma videos plus book and then i revised it the next week the book plus i started sketchy form after doing this i started physio physiology physio is such a good resource of physio and like they have other videos also, they have videos about biochem, but I, I loved their physiology because it was, I think it was the most in detail physio I've ever started. Like the most in detail physio guys, it was so good. And they explained almost about every concept that I like, you know, met in Quotient Banks or U World. That was such a good thing. Like I'll recommend physio if you have time. It took me about two weeks to finish through. Now I want to come up on to like one of the techniques that I invented for first aid. I don't think I invented this, but I just named it. So go with, with this guy. So this is a technique to revise first aid. I call it quotient based first aid revision. And it took me about one and a half months to do this. So guys, I want to first like emphasize on things like that. There's a difference between reading first aid and understanding first aid. Reading first aid is just going through first aid passively and not understanding how this how every line you know can present as like as something in a clinical vignette and you like while you go through first aid it's just passive learning and you don't get the actual concepts and you don't understand how that applies to you know real life and the clinical vignette and that's i don't think that's a good strategy to go by so like what you should do is you should try to understand it and how you try to understand first aid is through a question bank and what I would recommend is something called USMLE RX. So USMLE RX is by first aid, the first aid team itself, and it's based on first aid. And all the questions are, are made from first aid, and that's why it's such a good resource. So I, I did 60 questions per day, and that's all I did, guys. I did 60 questions per day with Sketchy Farm, and it took me about one and a half months to go through USMLE RX, and there are about 2,400 questions, I think but i thought i really thought it was so worth it i just explained qfar so this is the qfar technique so you use usmle rx you go through 60 questions a day and what you do is so one, once you start reviewing those questions you look at the question then you look at your answer whether you're right or wrong and then you go through the explanation this is such a good way to learn for state because all of this info that you're seeing is actually given in for state and when you go through the explanation and you, you know, you, you, you read it so, so many times and you then like go, go to four state. And the good thing about USMLE RX is basically it mentions the page of four state that question was made from. So basically this, so like, it's such a good process. So after the explanation, they, they mention the page, like the, the, that this question was taken from, and you can go and read that up. So you're reading four state in a question based manner and you are asking yourself questions and you have this curiosity curiosity about you know how this like first it applies you know to clinical vignettes and how everything is a context that it can present in and how like you know how much variety that single disease can present in is so amazing guys and you know if you do 60 questions a day and you finish all of usmle rx you can almost cover 90 to 95 percent of first aid and that's so huge guys like and you can cover first aid in a quotient based manner and you can see how everything in first aid applies you know in a clinical based scenario and that's so huge for usmle guys like i just want to again like you know emphasize on that qfr question based first aid revision it's based on clinical vignettes so you understand the context 
like in which first concepts and info apply to you know to questions clinical vignettes like i mentioned that's so important guys and then you're doing something called active studying and so whatever you're reading is actually relevant you're not just going through stuff not understanding it and you know how it applies in like into clinical vignettes or questions you're going through something called critical thinking and active thinking in which you do a question and you get an answer and then you, like you get some feedback on like how you did and then you go through the explanation and you understand the question in a clinical based manner and you understand everything on first in a clinical based manner through this approach and this develops something like such deep understanding of first aid and that is so huge for usmle because usmle is really really based on first aid i think and first aid is so high yield for usmle and let's talk about pattern recognition clue recognition that you obtain through qfar so what is pattern recognition pattern recognition is basically so usmle tests you on the most common clinical presentations of a disease i'll give you examples for this so let's take for example dvt so dvt normally presents in a woman like who's more than 35 years old and she's either a smoker or she's using or like ocps or she's pregnant these increase the chances of you know co coagulability and so this is how like normally a dvd question presents and you should know this and like question banks help you so much because you see so much of, so many of clinical vignettes about dvt and most of them have this in common guys they have like a woman uh, like they they have a woman who, who's more than 35 who's a smoker or she uses ocps or she's pregnant and she presents with this swelling in a single leg swelling of one leg and she can have either a pulmonary embolism also that but that depends but this is something called pattern recognition again you can do this with even sarcoidosis sarcoidosis normally presents in a female patient who is an african american ethnicity and it's common in i think 20 to 40 years old patients and it always almost always presents with bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy and this is so important guys because that's how us only presents question for sarcoidosis this is the pattern that the question will mostly follow even in the real us mle and question banks help you so much this, these are just two pattern guys and there are like so many patterns that you need to go through like thousands of patterns that question banks you know give you the information of and pattern recognition is crucial for us mle because you can come to the answer very fast upon just seeing the question and boom you know the answer and then i want to talk about clue recognition guys clue recognition is something like most people miss so like i'll give you an example of clue recognition so the question says cardiopulmonary examination cardio cardiac examination is normal okay cardiac examination is normal what this means is the cause mostly is not cardiac so what that means is like basically if a person has like pericarditis he should have a pericardial rub but it says cardiac examination is normal so the answer is not pericarditis so even pericardial tamponade should present with muscle uh, with muffled heart sounds the question again says cardiac examination is normal pericardial tamponade is not the answer let me again emphasize this so let's let's say the question says lung examine pulmonary examination is normal what that means is the cause mostly is not pulmonary please please notice i'm using mostly because there are scenarios where the answer could be pulmonary but you need to go through the question banks to develop that kind of awareness so i like but pulmonary examination is mostly like pulmonary auscultation so basically let's think about pneumonia pneumonia should present with uh, bronchial uh, breath sounds right but if pulmonary examination is normal the answer most probably is not pneumonia the answer is the answer is something else can the answer be pneumothorax if pulmonary examination is normal and it's given normal in the question the answer can't be again like pneumothorax because pulmonary examination will be normal you will have decreased breath sounds can the answer be pleural effusion again you will get decreased breath sounds but this pulmonary examination is normal the answer is not pleural effusion so this is something called clue recognition and you can use this to eliminate so many you know choices and 
I'll go into this later into my other video because this is a really big topic to cover guys. I just wanted to give you an idea of what pattern and clue recognition are and you get so much of, you know, information about this from question banks because you start seeing this pattern like, you know, these things like clues, like pulmonary examination is normal. So the answer can't be pneumonia, right? So I'll get to get to it in my next video, guys. So QFAR again, guys, it took me about one and a half months. I covered Sketchy Farm with it. And I, I just want to emphasize, it's so funny. It's so hilarious. And I think Sketchy Farm is permanent. Like for me, visual mnemonics are amazing. If you like visual mnemonics like me, you'll certainly enjoy Sketchy Farm because it makes pharmacology so much of fun. Then I, I want to come to you world, right? It took me about three months to finish UWorld. UWorld is the most high yield question bank and everybody should do UWorld, right? The purpose of UWorld that most people get wrong is basically to simulate USMLE every day. You wanna simulate USMLE every day to build up consistency. Plus you wanna use it as an assessment tool. Most people use it as a learning question bank and that's fine. However, if you wanna score very high, you wanna use it as an assessment tool and I, I'll get to it in the next slide. How you should use your world is basically time plus random. The reason I'm saying this is because USMLE itself is random. It would not give you anything in a system wise manner. It would not ask you like a cardiology question, cardiology question, cardiology question, and then it will switch to behavioral science. USMLE is not like this guys. US, USMLE has random questions coming up. So doing your world in a system wise manner is not a good idea. You want to simulate USMLE every day so you can build up consistency, right? So guys, so you will took me about three months and most people would tell you to do two passes. I just did a first pass. I did not do a second pass. My reason for not doing a second pass was because I, I, I thought that I already know, know the answer. So what's the point of doing it that I could not get, get elimination practice because I already know the answer and I, I, I have not exposed myself to a question that I've never seen before. And I did not like, I did not get any elimination practice out of it. So I did not do a second pass. However, to, you know, comp like, however, to manage this, like, you know, I did a new question bank. I did Amboss more. I, I did all of Amboss and just physio and farm from Kaplan. I did mostly physio, some farm from Kaplan. So I did not do a second pass because, and, and I really don't think it's a really good idea because you already know the answers guys. And what's the point of doing something you already know the answers to and because it doesn't give you elimination practice. So I don't think it's a good idea. How you want to use your world is basically you want to use it more as a practice question bank, like for elimination practice and for clue recognition practice and applying concepts that are learning question man surely learn from you world like all the extra concepts that are not covered in first aid i will i will totally recommend that i am not saying don't use it as a learning question man but mainly you should use it, it as an assessment tool learn from it that's good however if you wanna score 250 plus 260 plus 270 plus you world should be using an assessment tool to build up consistency and that's important guys and elimination practice as i mentioned right so how to proceed if only you would, if you, if you are only you want to use your world once as a first pass and you're going to use another question bank. This is how I went through it. Take from it, like what you will and learn from it, what you will. So I did about 40 questions every day. It took me about one hour to finish a block of 40 questions and four to five hours for review. And the thing was with every question and with it, like it's, it's explanation it took me about six to seven minutes for each question. And I think it's very fast. The reason I was very fast was because I had already done USMLE RX and I knew first aid so, so well. Like I had done these things and I was, I knew these so, so well. I did not have to go through the explanation, like, you know, thinking, oh my God, I don't even know this. I knew most of it. So it was just like browsing through that and it was very fast for me. However, there was some extra info on the UL, like some questions I had never seen before. Some questions I did not know the answers at all to. For them, I made flashcards. And it took me about 15 to 20 minutes to go through those questions, guys. So questions you don't know at all, you you will take your time, guys. If you're confused about a concept, I took about 15 to 20 minutes for those. You can take even hours for that. Don't miss out on a concept. Every concept given in you will super, super important. And you know, take your time. So uh, uh, what I want to just say is I made about 25 flashcards. I know people who like 
per, I made 25 flashcards per block. I know people who had, who had done more, like who had made at least like, I think a hundred flashcards per block. However, they were not able to cover that. So I'll recommend if you're going to make flashcards, make less of them. And so it will be easy to revise in the end. Cause if you have to go through a lot of flashcards, one of my friends had like 7,000 flashcards. It was so hard for him. For me, I, I just had like 1,900 flashcards and it took me like five days to review. For the other question bank that I use like Amboss and Kaplan, I did 40 questions a day. It took me one hour to do it to them and two to three hours for review. I did not make any flashcards out of this because I was just like, I did not have time. And I, I was making sure that once I go through that question, I didn't have to, you know, like go through that concept again. I knew that concept well and I could like, go through so my last two weeks guys last two weeks i did like first aid revision this was my third pass of first aid my second pass was in the qfr technique where i use usmle rx with first aid this is my third pass of first aid plus i use pathoma and i started 12 to 14 hours a day and i gave my uw u world self-assessment one and u world self-assessment two during this process i think first aid revision is so so important for usmle because like i got like about I, I think i got two questions right out of first aid and if i had not done first aid 260 would not have been possible so if you have time the last week make time guys i, I won't say if you have time i say a hundred percent revise for trade because first it is very high yield guys it's a thing that you know people know but it needs to be said again and again so that's why i keep on emphasizing first it is super important guys so q banks guys okay why do you want to do q banks what i mean by this q banks is why why do you want to do it plus which q banks i mean is amboss usmle rx and kaplan other than you would the thing is you get like you get practice of this thing called differential diagnosis because most of the answer choices that you see like a b c d are the are actually differential diagnosis of the same like of the same symptoms like i showed you previously of jaundice so like you'll have hep like for jaundice you'll, the first choice you'll have is hepatitis a acute hepatitis a for for b choice you'll have a acute hepatitis b for c choice you'll have acute hepatitis C and for D choice, you might have something like malaria and it will be the same symptoms. However, you need to eliminate through other options to get to the right answer. And that's, that makes elimination makes everything very easy. And question banks teach you how to eliminate and they teach you differential diagnosis. And that makes learning so, so effective guys, long-term re retention increases. And this has been shown because first aid is so, so clinically relevant. Just think about you reading through first aid passively versus doing critical thinking and applying that knowledge to to you know solve questions like and that makes learning so so good and so so fun like I, I think it was so much of fun for me to go through questions and it was so like you know i loved the process i literally loved it guys and i think it helped me avoid exhaustion right i uh, like because you're you're letting your mind work you're letting your brain work and you're putting your mind to use and that really helped me guys and it was like there was feedback right so i never thought i got lost like never thought that that i was lost never lost because you know some people wonder like where they are going with their preparation however with question banks you always have this feedback of how you are doing and that's so important guys so much important like you know to not feel lost so and the last point i want to make with like question banks is because the thing is when you do more than one question banks you get like such variety of clinical presentations for the same condition take it dvt that you kind of you know get an idea of how dvt can present on the exam and it makes it so so easy guys and i i just don't know like me and dvt there'll be thousands of you know diseases that have a variety of clinical presentations and when you go through question banks you'll see that variety and that's so important like if you do another question bank like emboss usmle rx or kaplan I just want to go into again, like I want to emphasize what is a learning question bank, what is a practice more than learning question bank. So a learning question bank is basically Amboss, USMLE RX or Kaplan. And these are, and these are basically for learning concepts, learning to apply those concepts and then, you know, training your pattern recognition and learning to see clues. U world is more of an assessment tool. Do learn from it, guys. I'm not again saying don't learn from it. You should learn from U World. U World is the most high yield question bank. However, you must use it for your assessment. So, you know, like you build up some consistency and you see that you're bringing out consistent results, system wise and subject wise, and you have strong concepts. 
and the purpose of uworld is basically not to learn concepts but to apply them and you know and practice your pattern recognition learning to see clues learning question banks is just for you know learning these things learning pattern recognition learning to see clues however uworld is mostly for applying pattern recognition and learn like sh making sure that your pattern recognition is right and calibrated and like can you see clues consistently and can you see clues you know in a well defined manner you're not learning right now you're practicing pattern recognition and seeing clues in your world and i got a 93% on my first pass and that's very hard for a lot of people why it was very useful for me was because i had done us only rx and i had done for state so well that your world was basically practice for me i knew most of everything on your world besides a few things for which i made flash cards and i learned from it guys however again i want to emphasize use it more for practice than learning so i want to again go into details of question other question banks i used i used amboss i did it fully and i i thought it was very helpful I, what i love about amboss actually is basically they have a library that is updated updated with up to date so it's it's very like it has like such awesome information so like how it goes is basically you do a question you get your answer and go, go through the explanations right so each answer has its own explanation and the thing with that is so suppose you do a diabetes mellitus question right it's about diabetes mellitus so you could click on diabetes mellitus anywhere and once you click on diabetes mellitus it will open this big library and this big page about diabetes mellitus and you can go through that and that is so helpful and like what i love about that is you can press this thing called a high yield button once you press that it will underline certain points that are very high yield for step 1 and it makes it going through the like through the like question bank like going through the library very easy and you understand what's high yield because it's all underlined and that's very helpful guys like their library is awesome i'll recommend that and one thing about amboss is it has a lot of tough questions so if you score a bit low on amboss don't get low it's okay amboss is stuff however i want to again emphasize this because most people don't know this it's heavily based on first rate guys i did not know this for at first but as i went through it i kept on seeing the same stuff i had seen uh, seen on first rate and if you want to make your first rate strong amboss is a very good like platform for, for that one more thing i love about amboss is this thing called overlay so what overlay is so suppose you're going through the library and you look at subarachnoid hemorrhage right you go through subarachnoid hemorrhage and they'll show you an x-ray for the subarachnoid hemorrhage so what amos does is if you press the overlay button if you, if you were a person like me and i could not you know sometimes recognize where the subarachnoid hemorrhage was on the x-ray what amos does is you press the overlay button and it does a overlay on the subarachnoid hemorrhage and it shows you where it is and that is so helpful guys i i think more question marks should do it and but amboss is the best right now and no no other question mark does it so if you like it's very helpful for learning guys amboss has a library that's very helpful if you can get a subscription to amboss get it next i want to come to the captain question bank i just did physiology and pharmacology from captain question from the captain question bank and what i want to like tell you is it covers a lot of extra concepts that i like that you have never seen before on first rate or you world and so that's very helpful for elimination practice again where you don't know the answer and i think like that and a lot of other concepts you can learn from that might show up on the test and if you want to score a 260 plus and 270 plus 100% like you want to make sure that happens do this question bank it's very good you could you could either do do amboss or kaplan it's your choice and that's it guys so now i want to come into like subject wise resources so when to use subject wise resources so the main recommendation from me is the overall resources subject wise resources is only if you have very weak basics in a particular subject like pharmac i i had very weak basics in pathology and i always thought like i sucked at pathology and if you think that the similar way for some subject you should use subject wise resources and one more thing you want to see is if you have no improvement like despite a question mark in a particular subject like in again in a particular subject you should consider subject wise resources so here's a list of subject wise resources i want to first emphasize on one point i want to emphasize on kaplan guys i used kaplan during my third year i didn't use it for my main preparation however what i want to say is it is the best for basics if you want to make your basics very strong I would very very much recommend Kaplan. Like I would recommend Kaplan for physiology, anatomy, biochem, pathology is okay if you want to do it. Like pharmacology is amazing, amazing, amazing. Microbiology is amazing. Like behavioral sciences is awesome, awesome, awesome. 
again physiology is awesome awesome, awesome. anatomy uh, even, they even have neuro anatomy so that's pretty good and the thing with anatomy is they derive most of anatomy from embryology and that makes it so easy to learn and i love that about anatomy and biochem was one of the subjects that i literally hated before however like dr turco from kaplan is so amazing in explaining biochem so do kaplan if you can afford it how like the problem with it is, the problem with kaplan is basically it's you know very high priced but i think it's one of the most effective resources to use if you want to strengthen your subjects if you don't if you can't afford kaplan there are other resources that are as good as kaplan i think physio is very good like all the things that are highlighted here are the things that i have used the other things that i have not highlighted here like constanzo shelf notes pixorize golijan i have not used guys so physio is pretty good for physiology like it it it's like the most in detail resource i have found for physiology constanzo was used by a lot of my friends and they found it very effective so i'm recommending it anatomy shelf notes i could not use guys a lot of people use it in their last month i did not have time like i but however i have heard a lot about shelf notes and a lot of like you know good recommendations about shelf notes so i will recommend it like again let's like for biochem there's this resource called pixorize these are visual mnemonics these are very good for biochem i have not used it but a lot of my friends did and they got a really good like you know result out of it so just try it if you like it do it if you don't like it don't do it pathology there's pathoma but if like what i mean by this is suppose if your pathology is weak revise pathoma again and again again and again again and again right that's what i mean if your pharmacology is weak revise sketchy pharma again if your microbiology is weak revise sketchy micro again for behavioral sciences guys first in and b and b super important if you think it's weak go again through first in and b and b i promise you you'll get great results out of it for pathology again i did not use golijan golijan again has a very good review i did not like really like it because it was audio lectures plus i am not much i am not much of an audio learner i am much more of a visual learner pathoma has visual lectures that i found very effective so go according to what you will however i will say uh, golijan is a bit more advanced for path so take that into mind resources used in medical school again guys kaplan lectures plus notes in my third year of medical school to strengthen my basics najib videos are amazing guys they're so in detail plus they're so high yield dr najib like has these videos about ecg i thought like i had never understood ecg like i was so bad in ecg and he has these this 10 part series that goes through every bit of detail about ecg and you know how to read like this these things called pathological q waves and you know how QRS is made like how P is made how PQRS T is made everything guys so i i like it so much like they go through so much like i love like his ecg videos and i can't you know emphasize how important his ecg uh, videos are so if you have time go through the ecg videos his kidney disorders about like nephrotic syndrome and nephritic syndrome are the most in detail videos i've watched about nephritic nephrotic and nephritic cause my concepts before about nephrotic and nephritic were not that good however after i went through his videos i understood everything about nephrotic and nephritic and how you know you can divide m um, like you know minimal change disease mpg and, and a lot more so like consider najib for building concepts and then i use picmonic i love picmonic for neurocutaneous disorders like tuberous sclerosis torch weber neurofibromatosis 1 2 and vhl they're amazing and try them if you have time now i'm going to emphasize on something called tracking progress so how you track progress is how i did it, did it was basically through u world it was my assessment tool and then i use practice tests like nbme UWSA. I did not use Kaplan and Amb uh, Kaplan and Amboss assessments because I did not have time. If you have time, go through them. They are amazing. Uh, NBME. Like uh, out of these practice tests, what I would recommend the most is NBME more than UW U World self assessment more than Kaplan Amboss assessments. So NBME twenty twenty one twenty two twenty three twenty four. I think are the most important NBMEs right now. And try giving them. Try giving one. UWSA uh, U World Self Assessment is U uh, U World Self Assessment one and two. You get this with U World subscription, or you can buy them separately from U World. However, if you have to choose between any of these, choose NBME guys. So why you want to track progress, right? Why you want to use practice tests? Why do you want to track progress? You want to build up consistency, and you want to make sure that you are very consistent so that your performance in USMLE 
is very consistent with what you have and you don't want to risk your SMLE, right? You want to make sure you get a good score so you can get the residence your dreams. So building up consistency is super important that you get. Like for like suppose for the same system, you're scoring, uh, like your score is either like going like this or improving, going like this or improving and it's not falling down, guys. This should not happen. It should not fall down. It's It, it should it should improve or should like stay on a plateau for some time and in improve and stay on a plateau for some time that's fine guys if it's improving like this that's awesome feedback is super important guys to see how you're doing and you know are you improving or are you like going down so super important and you know super important so that you know you stay focused through the process because this builds up focus and shows you how like shows you that you are not lost and that you're making either progress or you're going down and it's super important for step one and then again you know you you kind of want to learn the pattern for step one and i think nbme teaches this so well if you go through an nbme you kind of learn how the pattern of questions can be and how can they ask questions and that is so important guys and lastly it builds up confidence once you score good in your nbmes your you will self assessments or your assessment tests you kind of get this confidence that you will do like step one well and that's like huge for step one guys now i'm going to show you my practice test so i, I started my practices about three months before the exam i started with form 20 then i did form 21 23 24 my last like this was my last week like before step one my la sorry my last two weeks So start early with your form so you get an idea. My, my first form was 261 guys. The result, the, the reason for this is because I had again done first aid plus I had done USMLE RX with it. I had already done two passes of first aid plus like a lot of other resources like Pathoma and Sketchy that were so so important plus I had actually started UWorld like I had done about you know like at this test I had done about I think 30% of UWorld. So that's what I'm going to show you guys. I, I got good enough without doing your world first and i scored a 261 on my nba like my nbme 20 because i was so good with questions like i'm not trying to praise myself again i'm just emphasizing why question banks are so important guys right and as as i went through my like scores improved like my uwss scores were good i think th these were a bit like you know uh, over prediction my score in the end was 260 so that i was a bit sad too because i had scored much higher in my nbmes and uwsa however you know it's your score is what it is you can't change it like i i'll do better in step two guys right so what if i don't score well in my first nbme or you or you know uwsa or uwsa guys or any question bank in the starting guys it's okay guys what i want to say for that is you should not worry about your current results what you should worry is about your trajectory so let's take like a scenario in which a guy starts like with the 220 on his maybe form 20 and another guy scores like 170 on his form 20 what really matters is guys is basically what your trajectory is your result you can't change your current results what you can do is you can change your future results and if you maintain your trajectory well enough you can go high enough so suppose if this guy's trajectory is low he might have end up scoring like 240 however if you work hard every single day and you make sure that you follow you know you follow a system for your step one and you have good habits for reading and studying you can make your trajectory will be like super awesome and you can even score higher than this guys you can score even 250s you can score you can go to 260s you can go to 270s don't worry about it guys just maintain your trajectory even if you score like i did not score well in like when i started usmly rx however i got good 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 every single day and i think you should kaizen it getting one like getting good one percent like every single day you'll become 365 percent better by the end of the year so kaizen it guys just work every single day work hard like work as much as you can and you know improve your like score and don't worry about your current results so now i'm gonna get into my regrets like what regrets i had through the step one process my regrets are made like these are my regrets guys my regrets are mainly uh you know two days prior to the two days before my step one i do not have any regrets about my resources so 
the one thing i really hated was i just reached just like one day before the hotel near the test center so my like you know my test center wasn't in my city so i live in the city called ludhiana my test center was in some place called gurgaon and i had to go there and i had to book a hotel for that and the thing with that was like that hotel was so so disturbing like 2 am in the night before step 1 I heard sounds of people like checking in, coming in and you know making sounds. I could not sleep because of it. I woke up and it was so disturbing guys. I could not say anything to the hotel too. And then like I had a glass wall and like at night at like even 2 a.m. I had outdoor light coming. So I had not prepared for this and I was not prepared for this and this disturbed my sleep for at least like 2 hours. And I got just 4 and a half hours of sleep. and i wanted to sleep at least for 6 hours 6 and a half hours so that i could sleep well so what i would like and because of that i think my test score like you know dipped a bit because i i had like four questions that i could have gotten right and they were very simple and after i did the test i was like oh my god how did i do them wrong the only reason i got those four questions wrong was basically and they were very simple guys was basically i could not think properly and because i did not sleep well and i just want to emphasize get enough sleep and be you know be prepared like go 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 to the like if you have a test center that's really like not in your city and that's outside go there two days before two days before i i went there one day before and make sure you're okay with the hotel make sure you're okay with the accommodations and one more thing get some earplugs and sleep mask to ta- tackle the things that i got like sounds and outdoor light so that you do not get your disturbed throughout your sleep and that is very important guys sleep is super important for exam like step 1 that requires multi step thinking and one more thing i did not take enough breaks like even like one day before i was like even i think you know one day before i was studying a bit and i got burned out pretty fast throughout my preparation and you know so take breaks like take your sundays as an offs take like you know maybe like enjoy your process don't study too hard that you burn out just enjoy it and you know take breaks guys i did not do that so sleep i am a chronic insomniac guys again so i like most of my days i can't like most of my routine every single day i can't sleep like it takes me about 1 hour to sleep and for that i i found i think melatonin plus magnesium very important and this helped me like at least get 4 and 1/2 hours of sleep like before my step 1 so if you are a chronic insomniac like me use melatonin plus magnesium it's a very good combination however i'll recommend don't use them you know one day before the test like um, i don't want you to feel drowsy like i want you to adjust the dose well enough like if you can't sleep like try try these things one month before so that you can get an, an adjustment of dose of what you know really suits you so that you can sleep well before the test and if you are chronic insomniac like me try to use this however if you are not an insomniac i would not recommend melatonin and magnesium like do not do them if you if you are not an insomniac however just like keep them handy like if the situation comes that you cannot sleep before the test these are very good like you know these are very good they don't even cause drowsiness so no drowsiness compared to bzds like benzodiazepines cause a lot of lot of drowsiness and like you don't want to be drowsy on your test day melatonin and magnesium don't do that however if you take very high doses of it, it they might do that so please try to adjust it like you know t- start with these one month before and see what do- dose adjusts you if you can permit it like and if you're not in insomnia try not taking them like these are just only emergency cases like when you're like oh my god i won't be able to sleep try them out and i hope this helps stress guys don't get stressed take two days off before the exam i did not do that guys like i i took an off like you know i took an off at least for one day before the exam again i was stressed how i was reading in the morning like one day before the exam and i was very stressed for it i think but taking that one day off i think bumped my score up and i think that's very important for a step like for an exam like step 1 that requires such multi like you know such important multi step thinking and if you're really stressed you can't think guys and that's going to like you know that's going to dip that's going to make your score dip down if you get it so take at least two days off before the exam i took like i think i took half a day off so did that so stress plus anxiety guys again i want to get into the stress plus anxiety i want to think of like i want you to think them like a lion so if you're giving a test and you're at the prometric center and I, and i place a lion just bef- like you know just on your back 
and there's a lion growling on your back would you be able to focus would you be able to think on the exam and that's the problem guys when you're stressed and anxiety you cannot think because your fight or flight system is activated and your and when your fight or flight system is activated because of stress and anxiety you can't think and for a step 1 exam that involves multi step thinking you are doomed and you'll end up getting a bad score because step 1 has second and third order questions right and if you're not able to think and you're really stressed and you're really anxious that's going to be a huge problem and so how you this is the solution should be you should have a chill attitude you should not worry about the result it's okay guys you've studied well enough don't take tension like you should be outcome independent that's what i mean by you know no worries about the result and you should love like just fall in love with the process like you know fall in love with the process of solving questions you know going through first trade and you know don't worry about your final result just put hard work in and just put as much as hard work you can don't get burned out and relax what this does is it kills your fight or flight system your parasympathetic system is turned on and now you can think guys and that will lead to a good score so don't take stress don't take stress don't be anxious and i hope that helped right you assembly should not be a piece of cake guys i put my heart and soul into this video like so many people ask me so many queries and i put all the answers here so please like subscribe and like one more thing guys thank you so much for watching and one more thing guys elimination theory so elimination theory is something i discussed before and i i'm going to make a whole video on that it's going to the usmle question blueprint and it's going to be out soon it it might take even 15 days it might take even a month and it's about how to get to the answer without always knowing it and it's super important for usmle guys it like it was like just please wait for my next video i'll like try as hard as i can to explain elimination to you and okay guys thank you so much for watching again and thank you